In this part of our Crash Course Trigonometry series, I'll talk about reference angles and how we use them to compute values of trigonometric functions. So recall that we've got this definition of our trig functions. Remember, we started talking about right triangles, and then we expanded our definition to be able to find a trigonometric function of any angle. And what we do is we find any point we want on the terminal side of our angle, and then we call that point A comma B. We compute R, which is the distance from the origin to that point, and then our six trigonometric functions are ratios involving A, B, and R. So what's a reference angle? So when we have an angle in standard position, the reference angle for that angle is the acute angle formed by theta and the x-axis. So if theta is our angle, wherever that terminal side ends up, we look at the angle formed by the terminal side and the x-axis, either the positive x-axis as we have over here. Here's our alpha formed between the uh, angle and the terminal side of our angle and the positive x-axis. Or sometimes that angle is formed with the negative x-axis, as happens in the diagram on the left here. So whatever that acute angle is, it's always going to be between 0 and 90 degrees, and that's going to be what we call the reference angle. Now, a quick note here, if theta happens to be what we call a quadrantal angle, remember that's a weird word that just means that the terminal side of our angle lies along one of the axes, either the x-axis or the y-axis, then actually this definition doesn't work. There is no reference angle because there isn't actually an angle that is acute that's formed between the terminal side and the x-axis. So that's an exception to our definition. But in the previous video, we learned how to find the values of our six trigonometric functions for quadrantal angles. So we're gonna put those angles aside for the moment and assume for the rest of this video that theta is not a quadrantal angle. Okay, so what do we do with reference angles? Why do we care about reference angles? Well, it turns out that reference angles are quite useful because the sine, cosine, tangent, etc., the six trigonometric functions of any angle theta is either plus or minus the sine, cosine, tangent, etc., of that reference angle. Let's think about why that is. So here we have our x and y axes. Let's say that we have an angle where the terminal side lies in quadrant two over here. So here's our angle theta, and then our reference angle is alpha formed in there. So if we follow our definition and pick a point a comma b on that terminal side, then what we have is a right triangle where the distances in that right triangle are not exactly a and b. So the height of this triangle is my y coordinate, that's b, that's a positive number. But the base of this triangle is not quite a because a is negative so what it actually is, is the absolute value of a. So a is a negative number, but the distance there is just the negative of a, which is the positive distance uh, on, along the x-axis. Now the hypotenuse of this triangle is still r. It is still the square root of a squared plus b squared, because even though a is a negative number, the a squared is gonna get rid of that negative. So the only difference between the right triangle approach here and the find a point along the terminal side approach is that the x value here happens to be negative. So in this case, the sine of theta is, as we know in our definitions before, b over r. And so that's actually the same as the sine of alpha because in that right triangle, the sine of alpha is opposite over hypotenuse, the opposite is b, and the hypotenuse is r. Now the cosine of theta here is, again from our definitions, a over r. But the cosine of alpha is adjacent over hypotenuse. That's the absolute value of a over r. So sometimes these values match up, and sometimes we get just the plus, the, the sine of theta equaling the sine of alpha, and so on. And sometimes it's off by a minus sign. So in this case, the cosine of theta would be minus the cosine of alpha. Remember, for an acute angle, all six of our trigonometric functions are always positive. But for general angles, sometimes those values are negative. So the reason why we care about these reference angles is because we, we can use right triangles to figure out the values for acute angles, and then we can compare those to the six trigonometric functions for the general angles that we want. And the only difference is going to be that it's either plus or minus. Okay, so which is it? Is it plus or minus? Well, it depends on what quadrant the angle lies in. So if x and y are positive, if I'm in quadrant one, then the a, b, and the r are all going to be positive numbers, and so all of the values of my six trigonometric functions are going to match up with the values of my reference angle. They're all going to be positive. 
In quadrant two, when x is negative and y is positive, then the trigonometric functions that involve the x value, that involve a, are going to be negative of the corresponding value of the reference angle. In quadrant three, when x and y are both negative, the values that correspond to both a and b, in this case, that would be tangent. So in this case, tangent of theta is b over a, and b and a are both negative, so that's going to equal the tangent of alpha because the tangent of alpha is always going to be positive. Here we have a negative divided by a negative, which is going to be positive. But for example, the cosine of theta, which is a over r, that's going to be the negative of the cosine of alpha because a is negative and r is always positive. And then in quadrant four, when x is positive and y is negative, we're going to have all of the trig functions that involve the y value are going to be negative. So let's look at an example. So the, uh, if we want to compute the sine of 7 pi over 6, let's roughly sketch this angle. Again, if it helps to convert this to degrees, we can take 7 pi over 6 multiplied by 200, sorry, 7 pi over 6 multiplied by 180 over pi, and that's going to work out to be 210 degrees. So 210 is a little bit more than 180. So if we draw this angle, it's going to go just a little bit past 180 degrees and give us a terminal side down here. So that's going to be 7 pi over 6 which is 210 degrees. So what's the reference angle? Well, what's the angle formed by that terminal side and the x-axis? Well, that reference angle is this angle in here, which is going to be 30 degrees because we went 180 and then we went an extra 30 beyond. So that's going to be the 30 degree reference angle. And so what we know is that the sine of 7 pi over 6 is going to equal plus or minus the sine of 30 degrees. And again, if we think about whether it's plus or minus, we think about what would happen if we picked a point A comma B on this terminal side. We don't actually have to pick the point. We just have to think about what that point would look like. In this case, A and B are both negative because we're here in quadrant three. We know that the sine of seven pi over six is gonna be B over R. B is negative, R is positive. So the sine of seven pi over six will be negative. So this sine value Will be some negative number because it's a negative divided by a positive. Which negative number is it? Well, it's going to be negative sine of 30. And we know that the sine of 30 degrees is 1 half, so the sine of 7 pi over 6 is negative 1 half. So we can use our knowledge of trig functions of acute angles to figure out the trig functions of any angle using these reference angles. Let's do one more, secant of 660 degrees. So let's think about 660. Let's break that down. So that's 360 plus 300. So that means we're going one full time around the circle, 360 degrees. And then we go almost another full rotation around the circle. We go 300, which is another full rotation, less 60 degrees. So that means we're going to stop 60 degrees away from completing a second full rotation. That's going to be 660 degrees. And again, our reference angle is going to be this angle formed between the terminal side and the x-axis. How big is that angle? Well, it's 60 degrees, because that's how much we stopped short of completing that second full rotation. So again, using reference angles, the secant of 660 degrees is going to be either plus or minus the secant of 60 degrees. So we have two things to figure out. Is it plus or is it minus? And what is the actual secant of 60 degrees? Let's do one thing at a time. Let's think about whether it's plus or minus. Again, what we do is we imagine what would happen if we picked a point A comma B on that terminal side. Again, we don't have to actually pick a specific point. We just have to think about what that point would look like. Since we're in quadrant four, A is positive and B is negative. But secant of 660 degrees is going to be R divided by A. In this case, R always positive, a again positive, so that means that this is a positive number, and so the secant of 660 is just the positive secant of 60. All right, now what's the secant of 60? I don't know about you, but I don't really have secants of our special angles memorized, but what I do know is that secant is 1 over cosine, and I know that the cosine of 60 degrees is 1 half, and 1 divided by 1 half is 2. If you did happen to have the secant of 60 degrees memorized, then that's great, you just knew that that was 2. So that's how this reference angle thing works. So we figure out where the angle lives 
we figure out what the reference angle is, we use our knowledge of trig functions of acute angles, and then also our knowledge of which values x and y are positive and negative in the four quadrants. We figured that out. So a quick way to keep track of these signs rather than having to sort of pick a point and, and do that step every single time, this is a quick little uh, way, a reference guide to remember this. So the A here stands for all. So all of our trig functions are positive in quadrant one. In quadrant two, because the Y value is positive and the X value is negative, the sine and its reciprocal cosecant are positive and everything else is negative. In quadrant three, tan and cotan are positive while all the other four trig functions are negative and then in quadrant four cosine and its reciprocal secant are the trig functions that are positive and everything else is negative so what the satc here is telling us is which of the six trig functions is positive so in quadrant one they're all positive in quadrant two, sine and its reciprocal are positive. In quadrant three, tan and its reciprocal are positive. And in quadrant four, cosine and its reciprocal are positive. So let's do one more example. Let's suppose something different. Now we don't have a specific angle, but suppose that we're given that the sine of theta is negative one fourth and the tangent of theta is positive. And we're asked to compute cosine of theta. Well, we've done problems sort of similar to this a little bit uh, earlier in an earlier video where I gave you the value of one trig function and we had to figure out the value of other trig functions. And the way that we did that was using identities. So what's an identity that relates the sine of theta to the cosine of theta? Well, you might remember the Pythagorean identity. The Pythagorean identity says that the sine squared of theta plus the cosine squared of theta equals one. We're given that the sine of theta is negative one fourth. So this is negative one fourth squared plus cosine of theta squared equals one. That's one sixteenth. So cosine of theta squared is 15 sixteenths. And that means that the cosine of theta is going to be plus or minus the square root of 15 over 16. Remember, whenever we take the square root of both sides of an equation, we get a plus or a minus. So we get a similar question to what we had before. Is it plus or is it minus? And the answer to that question depends on what quadrant this angle lies in. And that's where this information about tangent being greater than zero comes into play. We really know two things about this angle. We know that the sine is negative. So because the sine is negative, we must be in quadrant three or four. Because all of the trig functions are positive in quadrant one, and sine is positive in quadrant two. So because sine is negative, we must be in quadrant three or quadrant four. But we're also told that the tangent is positive. And which quadrants is tangent positive? Well, tangent is positive in quadrant one and in quadrant three. That's from knowing that tan is positive. So by process of elimination, we must be in quadrant three. So theta lives here in quadrant three. Okay, so is cosine positive or negative in quadrant three? Well, we know that cosine is negative in quadrant three. So that means since we're in quadrant three, cosine is negative. So the cosine of this mysterious angle theta that we're talking about is minus the square root of 15 over 16. So that's how we use this information to figure out what quadrant we're in. And then once we know what quadrant we're in, we can figure out whether our value is positive or negative. Okay, so what have we talked about in this video? We talked about reference angles, what they are, and how we use those reference angles to compute values of trigonometric functions. We also understood how the sine of each of the six trigonometric functions depends on the quadrant that the angle lies in. Remember that we put aside those quadrantal angles because we talked in a previous video about how to figure out the trig function values of those special quadrantal angles. Next time, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about the unit circle approach, which is a different way of defining trigonometric functions, but it's also gonna match up to the definitions that we've already established. See you then.